Hello, I'm Dr. Scott Wharton, the TOS guy. Hello to everybody out there from beautiful downtown Sunnyvale, California, near the beautiful Apple, Apple campus. And uh, today we're going to address five questions that we commonly get from TOS patients. They might seem a little bit disconnected, but this is all from you folks who want to know more about TOS. So let me remind you, hit the like button, subscribe if you haven't subscribed yet, and get your friends and colleagues and anybody who's interested in this material to subscribe because it helps drives us to be found by more people. And make sure you hit that little bell button because our schedule changes frequently. And if you hit the bell, you'll be notified of every time we're posting a new live chat or a new video. So let's get started. Our first question is, why do baseball pitchers seem to get TOS at a higher rate? So let's understand that the data on baseball pitchers is a little bit out there. There's a lot of suspense and a lot of unknown. First of all, from the little bit of literature that's out there, and this is the lay press, but also a few papers, we know that baseball pitchers do not uniformly get better after surgery. Granted, they're elite athletes and trying to maintain that elite edge may be tough. We don't know how long they have TOS before they go to surgery. And honestly, we don't even know if they have the correct diagnosis of TOS when they do go to surgery. If you've worked with professional athletes, and I've had the privilege to do so occasionally, they are protected by a whole coterie of managers and agents, and everybody wants a shot at these guys or gals. And so they tend to channel down to very few docs, the team docs, and the team trainers all are a small circle. And we've had the privilege to speak with some of these people, but it is a narrow field with especially narrow thoughts on how to get these players better and back up and playing. Of course, they're very valuable assets for their team. So time is important. You can't take a year off very easily without affecting your team. So there is a paper written by uh, Thompson et al. a while ago. I talk about that one frequently. I don't think that does uh, really help a lot with understanding how TOS helps patients. They took pictures and after their numbers fell off, they eventually got to surgery. Now, mind you, these pitchers, because they're so valuable, no one wants to put them on the uh, the DL and no one wants to take them off the playing field. So a lot of them struggle through it. They always have aches and pains. Look, they're pushing themselves to the peak of performance. They're probably icing down their arm for hours after each pitching start. So when they have aches and pains and it's slow onset, they probably don't go to see a surgeon right away. So in this particular paper, they got uh, the surgeons uh, got the TOS patients, they weren't diagnosed with imaging, but by a regular clinical exam, and we know how fraught that can be. And this was after their performance had dropped off. That's when the pitchers finally go and start considering surgery, when their numbers drop off. So their numbers dropped off, they had surgery, the numbers were compared before and after the surgery, and they showed in several of the pitchers, this is a small study, that their numbers hadn't changed. Now to me, that's not effective. You want to see their numbers go back up to where they were not just before the study, but before they had symptoms. So we don't know how long they had TOS. Uh, we don't know who diagnosed them because let's face it, we've all been through this. If you're watching this and you're a TOS patient, you know how hard it is to get a diagnosis. So a lot of these baseball pitchers may not have been diagnosed. And the longer you go without a diagnosis, the harder it is to recover, especially when you're at the edge, the performance peak and the envelope there. So there's not a lot of data. There's a, a bunch of assumptions out there. The axillary artery crosses from the neck and chest into the arm. And when you're in the full pitching position, that artery can be spread across the head of the humerus right at the shoulder here. So the artery can be stretched. And so some people believe that that creates TOS. But there's very few cases that I know of with pitchers getting arterial TOS. They're much more likely to get neurogenic TOS like the rest of us. And if they're losing, even subtly losing sensation in their fingers, they're probably losing their control. Just think of how precise these guys have to be throwing a ball 90 miles an hour or greater. And then having the ball come off your fingertips and directing it to a tiny spot you want it to go to 60 feet away. So I would bet that if we really looked at it and we went back, we'd find these pitchers losing some of their control as an early sign. Nonetheless, the data is short on these guys because they're such a small population, but <clears throat> it brings up the fact that other athletes who use their arms overhead, such as rock climbers, get TOS, and volleyball players, if they're spiking the ball, they've got their arm way over their head with maximal effort. Swimmers, 
do it to both sides. We know that venous TOS, Paget Schroeder disease, occurs more commonly in some of these young athletic swimmers. So any overhead athletic sport with exertion in that position is going to expose you to a higher risk of TOS. And I would say that while neurogenic still is the most common, venous TOS probably becomes more common in those athletes than in the general population. So we have had the privilege of scanning a few high-level baseball pitchers, high minors, and major league after they've had surgery. And what we tend to see is post-surgical changes that include inflammation of the brachial plexus. And that's probably post-surgical because it's uh, the particular location we find it in, and it's so asymmetric from the other side. Even though they're using this one side to pitch, I've never seen a study, and I've never seen a case myself, of an overhead athlete who had diffuse inflammation of the brachial plexus or of large parts of it. So there are a lot of reasons why baseball pitchers should get TOS. Right now we have a paucity of data. I will say that we're lucky enough to have some very interesting people actively working in the field because they want these athletes to get through this with minor interruption of their careers. So stay tuned on that one. Hopefully over the next few years when we're making progress on some of these high-end baseball pitchers. Our second question, what are the most common causes of neurogenic TOS? So just to reiterate, we know that neurogenic TOS is not only the most common type of TOS, somewhere between 95 and 98% of all cases of TOS are the neurogenic type. But what we do know is it's also the most difficult type to diagnose. There are many underlying causes because people have different anatomy. And it's complicated by the fact that people use their neck and shoulder and arms in many different ways. So one common group who gets neurogenic TOS are people who work at computers. If you're spending eight hours a day or more, I'll bet you in Silicon Valley, it's a lot more. But everywhere, people spend time on their computers for hours on end. And many people use laptops. Now, what you're supposed to be in for the best ergonomic positioning is you want your hands down towards your knees with your wrists slightly bent forward. You want your head and neck fairly upright. And you want the monitor about 10 to 15 degrees below your eyes at the worst. Now, on a laptop, that's impossible. Either your head's in the wrong position or your hands are in the wrong position. I use a laptop all the time, too. When I go out and take my kids to do things, bring my laptop along so I can answer email and do the work that we're always doing here. And I'm sure a lot of you are the same. Also, we have other devices, phones, iPads, tablets of other sorts. So we're always using them in non-ergonomic positions, and we're doing it for long stretches of time. So I would say computer use and device use are very common causes of TOS. Secondly, athletes, as we just discussed, mostly overhead athletes. Uh, we do get a few weightlifters, but mostly it's people who are rock climbers, volleyball players, swimmers, baseball players. Pitchers and third basemen are the ones most commonly affected. Uh, don't see too many football players or quarterbacks. We'll see how that changes as recognition of the disease changes. And then I'd say there's another group of people who do a lot of manual labor. People like always thinking about UPS drivers or Amazon delivery people. They have stuff stacked up on shelves in their truck. They have to reach into weird positions. They have to carry stuff. Usually they've got something under one arm and their back is tilted. They're carrying a bag with the other hand or a box. So people who do manual labor of that sort, sonographers, if you've ever watched a sonographer do a study, or if you've had a sonogram, an ultrasound yourself, they have to manipulate the dials of this computer while they're bending over you and putting their arm in one place and then very slowly moving the transducer to get just the right picture. So they often hold unusual postures. So uh, those would be the three biggest types. I think these are people, oh, I left out one huge part, of course. Motor vehicle accidents and neck injuries. This is a very big part of the population of neurogenic TOS, what we used to call whiplash. I think whiplash now can be accepted as people who get acute neck pain, not spreading out to the shoulders or down the spine, that lasts for maybe six weeks after a motor vehicle accident or other similar neck injury from an impact. And I think that's pretty much accepted. Most of those people with acute whiplash will get better. But a significant amount, sometimes up to 50% in these studies, can have symptoms last longer than six weeks. Those are called chronic whiplash. 
And a lot of those people will have those symptoms I just mentioned, pain radiating down the arms, maybe one arm, maybe both. I think that huge population of chronic whiplash patients is much more likely to be thoracic outlet syndrome than to be this entity of chronic whiplash. And I will say the success rate for treating people with chronic whiplash is not as effective as we want it to be. And that could potentially be because we're not seeing it as neurogenic thoracic outlet syndrome. So people who use computers, athletes, people in motor vehicle accidents or other post-impact neck injuries, and then some oddball jobs where you have to hold unstable positions or unusual positions for long periods of time. Our third question, what medical specialist is most likely to treat TOS? So the first doctor who wrote about thoracic outlet syndrome was a guy named Astley Cooper in 1818. He became a Sir Astley Cooper after that, and he was a barber slash surgeon. I won't go into that too much, but surgeons at the time were different than they are now. Two of the famous people who have their names associated with the disease, Paget and Schroeder. Paget Schroeder syndrome or effort thrombosis when you get a subclavian vein blood clot. Paget was a pathologist and quite famous. And Leopold von Schroeder, I believe he was in Vienna. He was a urologist, a professor, and quite famous in his own right. Then you have people like Michael DeBakey. This is a cardiac surgeon who actually helped design the first MASH units. If you remember that TV show, MASH, well, he designed these mobile medical units that took young men right off the field when they were injured and did a lot of work to save their lives. Uh, he published on thoracic outlet syndrome too. And this is the way it's been, unfortunately or fortunately, depending on how you look at it, thoracic outlet syndrome has never been owned by a single specialty. Now, vascular surgeons do tend to work in this area of the thoracic outlet. They handle things like subclavian artery aneurysms or the blood clots that show up there. And so they have, because they know the anatomy and because they've been approaching the area for a while, they have sort of assumed the mantle over the past few decades of handling neurogenic thoracic outlet syndrome because it's in the same area. But that's maybe not necessarily the best indicator to learn what's the proper diagnosis and treatment. So we found that over time, many more specialists have gone into the thoracic outlet and become mostly self-trained experts because none of us gets a lot of this in medical school. I'm starting to see it now in post-medical school internships and residencies and some surgical programs. But usually, of all the people I know around the country, it's the people who picked it up by themselves and said, this is interesting, I'm going to figure it out. So how do you find a TOS specialist? It's not by searching a specialty. Yes, vascular surgeons handle it, but you know what? Neurologists handle it, and sports medicine docs handle it, and plastic surgeons who are also peripheral nerve surgeons handle it. So what we recommend, first of all, contact us at Vanguard Specialty Imaging. We're glad to help steer people to a specialist in their area if there is one, and then to give you a view across the nation of other people. Sometimes it's worth a trip, and some of these people will actually do telehealth consults, and that can really get you started down the road of knowing whether you have TOS or you don't have TOS, and what would be the next specialist to see. Okay, so TOS, because somebody is a TOS specialist, it's not tied into where they trained or what specialty they're in. Just find somebody like me, a radiologist. There's no reason for me to be involved with TOS, except it's a fascinating disease and there are a lot of people who need help. And that's what me and my group of people do at Vanguard Specialty Imaging. We feel we're really making a difference helping people. Why do they call me the TOS guy? Well, it's a little funny the way it started. I guess it branches out from what I was just talking about. I do have a special interest. Some would say an obsession on this. My kids tease me about it. And my wife made me get a personalized license plate that says TOS MRI. So I'm always reaching out, not just to patients, but to providers, doctors of all specialties, physical therapists, uh, people who, acupuncturists, people who help patients with TOS, because I always want to know somebody new. I can always hear a new idea that starts me down a new path of learning. And I can always save these resources, these valuable people for the patients who call us and need help. So I'm always talking to people. And I guess 
I'm not that memorable. I'm just the guy who talks about TOS too much. So the story I heard was there was a doctor in the East Bay here in San Francisco Bay Area, and he thought his patient had TOS. So he knew TOS a little, but he didn't know me. So he just turned to his medical assistant or his nurse, and he said, who is that guy? The TOS guy. And that's <laughs> kind of stuck with me. So it's not my name that's important. It's the fact that I'm obsessive about TOS. So uh, one thing I want to bring up at this point is it kind of illustrates that for many doctors, TOS is really at the periphery of their practice. They may have heard of it, maybe not. Maybe they say, oh, cervical rib, TOS, TOS cervical rib. Turns out that's a very weak connection. At least they're thinking about it, but they don't know much about it. So you as a patient, if you go to see a doc, your primary care doc or a sports medicine doc or an orthopedist, all of whom could be involved in TOS. But if they say uh, TOS and they get a puzzled look or they just bring up cervical rib, then it really falls on your shoulders to go and find somebody who is a TOS specialist, regardless of their specialty. Um, our job here at Vanguard Specialty Imaging has always been to raise awareness of the disease, to educate patients and care providers, and then ourselves to provide the best care that we can in our specialty. So anyway, I'm the TOS guy. Whoever that is, I don't remember. Thank you for that because I like it. So last question for today is, what is the most interesting thing you've learned about TOS this past year? I would say there's two things I can think of. One is, no matter how many patients we meet, all of us here at Vanguard, we meet patients and they all seem to have a little bit different story. And the stories themselves are fascinating, how people got to this point to reach out to us. Yes, part of it is how they developed TOS. And part of it is the trek they went through, the doctors they went through to get to this knowledge because nobody looks up thoracic outlet syndrome on Google. If you have neck pain or you have tingling in your arms, you don't say, ah, must be thoracic outlet syndrome. Now, I think we've made a difference over a lot of time, us and other people around the country who believe in this and who understand we need to gain more knowledge, I think they've helped raise awareness. Every time a pitcher is diagnosed with TOS, we see it on ESPN, and that carries a lot more weight than my little website. So uh, I think the stories we get from patients are fascinating, and I love to hear how they found their way to us. And the second thing I'd point out is I personally am truly blessed because this disease, we help people. It's intellectually challenging, but I also meet a lot of really cool people around the country. I was at dinner a few weeks ago with some other TOS specialist in the San Francisco Bay Area. And I looked at the table. There was a neurologist. There was a pain management doc who was also an orthopedist. There were two cardiothoracic surgeons. We come from all these different specialties. And we come together because we have this interest and we see these patients. And I think after a while, when you work in this field, you realize that your position is very important. It's great to be here, to be a source of help for people who can't find that help easily other places. So we love our success stories. We love our patients to say, I'm getting better. I found out what I have. I'm hopeful that now that I know what it is, I can work on it and make it better. Uh, I, I met a guy very fortuitously through a patient, a patient who's a really high level athlete. And he introduced me to a doctor in Atlanta who happens to be a team physician for many pro sports teams out there. And the guy knows a lot about TOS. Some of it is new to me and he's in a different field than I am. So I very much look forward to working with him because we're gonna be able to share information that I think in the end is gonna help people. So the two most interesting things I learned this year, if I can modify the question, are how many patients come to us with different backstories, and then how many great people there are working in this field, meaning there are ones that I haven't met yet and I look forward to meeting them. So now I'm gonna open it up to questions. And we greatly appreciate if you have any questions. I'll remind you, please subscribe. Please hit the bell so that you'll be notified of any new videos we put up, either live streams or videos we put up for other reasons. Our first question is from Humanity First. Oh, my body is in a dark place, having TOS and Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome, uh, Tarlov cyst, craniocervical instability, neuropathy, and some other disorders. But all my doctors are brushing them off. So... This is one of those situations that makes me think we need to take a step back and simplify. It's not clear which of those are contributing. 
Um, I have to add in, of course, that we're not providing specific medical advice here. I'm going to talk in generalities here. But if you have multiple conditions that have been diagnosed by different doctors, I think you need to focus on one or two at most and really nail down the diagnosis. Because sometimes what happens is one doc might diagnose craniocervical instability and another one might diagnose Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. You might have both, but it might just be one. So it's going to fall on you, unfortunately, to do a little bit of reading and research and understand how to move forward to confirm one, refute the other, or confirm both. You need to get rid of some of these diagnoses unless they're all truly there. Now, if they are all truly there, then the next step is in your treatment. You need to treat one. Really make sure you're treating that one and try to get it off the list. Because, of course, if you have multiple conditions going on at once, you can't really get rid of your pain. If you have three things causing four out of 10 pain and you get rid of one of them, you're still going to feel miserable. So you really got to focus first the diagnosis of each one, make sure it's correct. Secondly, the treatment of each one, try to get each one really addressed well sequentially and don't get overwhelmed. You can call us. We're glad to refer you to people who know TOS and um, the other diseases are not in our specialty and I would not presume to know a lot about them. But I can say there is some evidence that people with Ehlers-Danlos syndrome or other hyperflexibility syndromes are more likely to get TOS. So thank you. Obviously, we're sending good wishes and reach out to us if you need help finding a TOS specialist. All right, Tate. Hi, Tate. Uh, <laughs> very happy you are the TOS guy, Dr. Warden. Thank you. I didn't give the name to myself, but I like it because it fits my obsession. Thank you for coming again here. Were there any particularly memorable cases or patients you saw early in your career that were the spark for your interest in TOS? That is a really good question. So I would say, yeah, I remember one patient. It was a middle-aged woman, a short woman. She had a job. She was very busy. I remember meeting her. I used to meet all the patients because we did our scans at one place. And she was one of these really talkative people. She's very pleasant. Makes you feel happy when you talk to her. But she just talked. She talked a lot. And it was hard. Like the question we had by Humanity First, it was hard to tell what was going on because there were so many things going on. She had fallen down a flight of stairs at work. And for 10 years, no one had diagnosed her. And once we did a scan on her, she had one of the most severe cases of TOS that I've, I've seen. And to this day, I remember the findings. I've used some of her slides without name on it, of course, in some of our talks and presentations teaching people about TOS. And she was so relieved when we had a diagnosis. She hadn't been treated. She just finally had a diagnosis. And for all the people at her workplace who were saying, yeah, enough. We don't want to deal with it anymore. You're having pain. I think you're making it up. She really had an answer. And I think without it being that extreme, it was an indication from a higher level that says, you know, pay attention to people. You know, a lot of them are going through this emotionally as well as physically. So fortunately, because I have a really good team with me, we do handle that emotional part as well. And we understand it. And a lot of the docs I work with, are really good people, you know, good in their heart, and they understand the emotional part of it. Thanks. That's a really good question. Glad I got to share a little bit. Hi, Humanity. Thanks for your answer. Thank you for coming here, and please reach out to us. We're glad to chat offline. All right. Um, I don't think we have a lot of questions today because we talked about a lot of different stuff. I want to remind people, please subscribe, please follow us. You know, we're on Instagram and we're sending a bunch of short ones there now. We'll be sending some from today, actually. Uh, follow us on Instagram. We are also on YouTube, of course. And every subscriber we get and every like we get and every comment we get really helps spread the word to future patients. So we're here to help. I'm Dr. Scott Wharton, the TOS guy from Vanguard Specialty Imaging. <laughs> and I hope you all have a great week. Thank you for attending.